welcome to the show, Julie. It's great to see you again. Thanks for having me. I've really, um, really enjoyed getting into your latest book, Good Chemistry. Uh, it really resonated with me as a psychiatrist. I, uh, I've often thought about like what, how would I actually define if it's kind of a game I play in my mind of like boiling down mental suffering or mental illness to one sentence. And what often comes up for me is like a loss of connection or a, a rupture in, in various things that should be connected in various ways. And so, so your book with the kind of concentric circles of connection to self and partner and family and community and earth and cosmos, it just, just made a lot of sense to me. Thanks. Yeah. That, um, the book structure, it's, you know, the book had a lot of different titles. It went through a lot of iterations. I actually had nine separate book proposals back and forth with my agent and then tremendous painful back and forth with my publisher. It was really hard, but the one thing that was constant through it all was that structure. It just, you know, and I had other people get in touch with me being like, I was thinking about this structure too. And I was like, it's, I think it's a really, it just makes sense. Um, and I'm sure there are other, there are like, I think psychotherapy is based on that structure that you really have to start with yourself and connecting to yourself. But, you know, um, you're talking a little bit about like, like mental illness or mental wellness. And I think the first disconnection that really screws us up is just disconnecting from, uh, you know, the present moment. I mean, as soon as we get on our phones and we're in another world, we're sort of out of our bodies. We're not paying attention to, you know, our posture or how we're feeling or whether we're hungry or, you know, it, and, and we have all this past year just gone, gone to that place more than ever. Um, I felt sort of bad when the book came out because I was really preaching against you know, connecting via screens. And like, you've, this is all before COVID, right? I wrote this book before right. COVID and I'm like, you know, skin to skin, eye contact, pheromones, oxytocin, cuddling, orgasm, nursing, you know, and then it's like, uh, whoop, stop, you know, wear a mask, go back inside, don't be outside. So I was worried. I was really worried that it was like going to be dated, you know, but it turns out that because we're all so jacked into our screens more than ever that the the book still really kind of works because I I do I do rail against that as much as I am also on my phone and on my laptop all the time so yeah well it seems like it could go either way where you know it could be a problem but I I think it's very timely actually given given the heightened um, kind of for me anyway, like withdrawal symptoms of actually being around friends and family and being in three dimensions. Um, Keith and I uh, had a meeting with a, a person who we work very closely with who we had not met in person uh, since a year and a half ago. And we'd only met her once before in person. So it's just very bizarre. You know, li lives a few minutes from here. Yeah. So, but I, um, yeah, that, that skin to skin is, is super, super important. In, in, in my world. Um, yeah, we, uh, well that, that brings up actually a huge sort of can of worms, <clears throat> which is, uh, you know, you and I are psychiatrists. We know that our patients, even before the pandemic, were really touch starved. A lot of people, they really need to be held and not, you know, I understand that as psychiatrists, we're not supposed to hold them physically and we have to create a holding environment. But the truth is a lot of times what my patients really needed, you know, was to be hugged or stroked or soothed. And I know that there is a big proscription against psychiatrists touching their patients. I mean, to the point where at Bellevue, when we were admitting somebody to the psych ER, we would call the medicine residents to do physical exams because the psychiatrists weren't putting hands on patients. I mean, it, it was absurd, but that's really what we did. So, um, you know, and it's really taboo for us to touch our patients, but uh, you know, we are more touch starved than ever. And some of my patients really need that more than anything else. So it does create a bit of a conundrum. And I understand, um, you know, when I was, when I was assigning the, the people to write chapters for the ecstasy book, I had originally assigned the psychiatrist. Um, I won't mention his name, but, but a uh, good psychiatrist, but he was one of the early people to work with ketamine and work with MDMA. And then some of the other authors that I had assigned chapters to got in touch with me and said, we're not going to be in this book. If he's in this book, you might not know this, but, and it turned out the, this history of, you know, pretty serious transgressions with clients. Um, and 
so I told him he couldn't be in the book. And it was, you know, we didn't have a word, you know, was cancel culture was not a thing back in the, you know, 90s when I was putting this book together. Um, but th but these issues of sort of, you know, what I jokingly refer to as like shamans behaving badly, um, you know, we want to be healers, we want to help, we want to hold and soothe, but uh, there's a very clear line that we're really not supposed to go past. Um, and I didn't mean to get into this incredibly touchy area right off the bat. Um, but just, you know, when I start talking about how I feel like my patients need a hug, uh, maybe I'm in a privileged situation because I'm a woman and I can probably get away with a lot more tactile support with my patients, you know, and it's less of an issue. Um, but I think a lot of us do uh, intrinsically know that um, that people, you know, want to be held and need to be held. And a lot of behavior, you know, whether it's promiscuous sex or something more sublimating, like, you know, uh, compulsive shopping or something, it really can come down to this, you know, trying to scratch an itch. And the itch really is uh, wanting to feel like someone is uh, caring for you and, and has got your back, you know, literally. I love your title, by the way, the book of chemistry. Um, it's a, it's a really um, compelling title. And also, I wonder if we can actually zoom out a little into a chemistry lens um, and looking a little bit about when we talk about mental health and well-being and spiritual health and just getting a little into the chemistry of how that can go awry and what we need for balanced chemistry. And we can link it back to like what touch provides and, and other components, but maybe you could kind of give us an overview here of the chemistry of wellness. Uh, well, psychologically and there, you know, uh, there's a lot of, obviously a lot of pieces to this. And I would, I would start by saying everybody really has their own proprietary blend of the chemicals that work for them. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, some of us sort of rev high and we need to be soothed and some of us are sluggish and we need to be inspired. Um, but what I try to explain in good chemistry is that the the reason why hugging feels good and the reason why closeness and connection and bonding feel good, well, a few reasons. One is if it didn't feel good, you would die, basically. You know, if you don't want to be held and nurtured and, and you don't have a good baby face that makes somebody want to hold and nurture you, you're not going to make it. Um, so we get pleasure early on from uh, being held by our parents and nursing. And a lot of that, um, the pharmacology and the, and the sort of neural chemistry that undergirds that is really um, the endocannabinoid system, the endorphin system, um, and oxytocin. And, you know, I know that people uh, also, of course, when you're talking about satiety and feeling good, you have to include serotonin. And when you're talking about something that feels so good, you want to do it again and again, you're talking about dopamine. So, you know, the, the more you talk, the more the, the richer the soup of the pharmacology of what makes you feel good is. Um, but you know, one of the things I explain in good chemistry is about uh, what the opposite of fight or flight is, right? We all know fight or flight, uh, the sympathetic nervous system, you know, this is adrenaline and cortisol. And this was always sold to me. You know, so many times I learned that fight or flight was like the key to survival. And that's true for a very small percentage of the time, right? If you're being chased by a saber toothed tiger or something, you better, you know, be able to run away or uh, in other situations you need to be able to attack. But, but 95% of the time, what you really need to do uh, is, stay and cooperate and collaborate um, and sleep and eat and have sex and procreate and raise kids. And all of that can't happen in fight or flight. It only happens in the parasympathetic, you know, under the umbrella of parasympathetic. And as much as adrenaline and cortisol run sympathetic, oxytocin really is what runs the parasympathetic. But underneath oxytocin is endocannabinoids and endorphins and serotonin and dopamine. And one of the things that I learned that I was really excited about when I was researching good chemistry is how important the crosstalk between these neurotransmitter systems is. It's not really so binary. Um, and also that there is dimerization of the receptors, right? So that the receptors make dimers. They, um, they make receptor pairs that behave differently than the receptors alone. So like, for instance, the psychedelic receptor, I, I mean, nobody calls it the psychedelic receptor, but the 5-HT2A receptor, which is tickled by every classical psychedelic and 
plenty of other drugs that people enjoy. Um, the 5-HT2A makes a dimer with the oxytocin receptor when it is hyperstimulated. The cannabinoid receptor CB1 makes a dimer with 5-HT2A when it's hyperstimulated. So uh, this is one of the reasons why I feel strongly that cannabis can be considered a psychedelic. I, obviously, it's not a classical psychedelic, but high-dose THC does eventually activate the 5-HT2A. And uh, anybody who's sort of eaten too much of a pot brownie or uh, smoked too much hashish or something, you know, has had had these experiences of uh, a lot of a lot of the same sort of uh, comments that somebody who was taking a classical psychedelic might have in terms of increased meaning, uh, seeing things with new eyes, um, having sort of a loosening of associations and, and this feeling of connection, connection to self, connection to others. Uh, feeling sort of open hearted. You know, I, I am a cannabis user and there are times when I go out in nature and I feel very connected to nature, uh, you know, partly because I've had some cannabis or, you know, maybe looking at the stars and feeling very connected with the cosmos, which is uh, the way somebody might feel with a psychedelic. But you can get that to a, a smaller and more manageable extent um, with cannabinoids. So that's a long answer about uh what sort of chemistry undergirds connection? And, I, you know, the only other thing I will say is uh, because we are categorized, you know, the human species is categorized as obligatorily gregarious. We have to get along or we're not going to make it. So we all have developed um, our own proprietary blend of feel good chemicals that we get when we're doing a good job uh, connecting and socializing and bonding Um you know, that uh, it makes us feel good and it's supposed to make us feel good. Otherwise, we're not going to survive. Can you say a little more about um, the chemistry around the urge for connection and also what can kind of go awry for some people around the cycle of connection and how that happens in terms of people who can't get satiated, in terms of yeah. people who shut the urge down completely and they don't even seek connection, they go into isolation for long periods of time. Just kind of like speaking to a little bit about, you know, how does the urge for connection develop in the body? And then how does that also sometimes get people into these places that they don't really want to be? Right? Well, um, you know, there's there's a saying that I think was Gabor Mate, but I'm not positive. And I always want somebody to like correct me if I'm wrong. But the, um, there's a saying in the addiction community, which is that you can never get enough of something that almost works, you know, and you will try to make up in quantity, what you're not getting in quality. And a lot of us um, in our childhoods, um, e you know, even if we were attended to well <laughs> uh, most of the time, there was always going to be some episodes where you didn't get your needs met, um, where you were rejected in a state of need. Um, you know, I like they, they say, like, even if you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth, you know, at some point there's like a distracted caretaker bonking, you know, your face with a spoon because they're paying attention to something else. Like trauma is relative. Right. And if you have a really easy time of it and then something terrible happens, that's still your trauma, even though to somebody else they were like, you know, on my best day, I would be, you know, on my worst day, whatever. It's all relative. So um, but if if you have a sort of deprived childhood where you're not making attachments, where you're not uh, either you're not attaching to your caretaker, or your caretaker is not attaching to you. What you're going to end up with in terms of chemistry um, is a bit of a deficit in in your body's capacity to soothe itself. You're going to have this sort of uh, ruffled feathers, angsty, I need something, I don't know quite what it is. Um, I've got an itch and I have to figure out how to scratch it. I mean, that is sort of what happens when you when you don't get really solid attachment in childhood. And it, it sets uh, like a, a tone or a threshold for what it's going to take for you to, to feel good. Um, and so some people learn to soothe themselves, you know, they... Uh, I don't know. I was a thumb sucker. I think I learned to soothe myself orally when I was very young. I was a thumb sucker. Then, then I bit my nails. Then I started smoking cigarettes when I was like 10, which is ridiculous to me, but I did. Um, and, you know, then I was drinking or whatever. I mean, or then I was eating or I was hiding eating, but, you know, it was clear to me uh, that this, this was how I soothed myself was orally. Um, and maybe, you know, I wasn't nursed long enough 
uh, or I mean, you know, what happened in my situation is that I wasn't nursed that long and I was switched uh, from breast to cup because I rejected a bottle, whatever. This is the story. But everybody has got these stories of uh, how they were or weren't sort of attended to as babies, as children. You know, whether the attachment was secure or insecure has a lot to do with where your sort of chemistry set point is going to be. How How resilient are you to stress? How easily can you soothe yourself? Can you do it on your own with your breath or just, you know, with calming thoughts? Do you reach, uh, you know, for something to eat or smoke or inject because you're upset? Um, You know, obviously little babies uh, aren't, aren't injecting themselves with drugs, but they do all sorts of things to try to soothe themselves or to try to get somebody else to pay attention to them. And so the other thing that you see in older people who have insecure attachments is they is they will often uh, make bigger and bigger sort of fusses to get somebody to to love them and pick them up and say, I'm taking care of you. However, nobody likes a fussy baby. <laughs> nobody likes a fussy adult. You know, they make bigger and bigger people back away. They don't want to deal with it. You know, it's this um, maladaptive response, <laughs> you know, to stress. So I think all of us in the last year have been seeing our own maladaptive responses to stress and other people's and, you know, what's at stake. Um, On on the other hand, I think a lot of people are sort of figuring out, you know, what's important, um, what actually, you know, what feeds my soul, what nourishes me, um, what feels authentic to me. uh, And maybe we should be getting rid of some of this other stuff that's extraneous and stressing us out unnecessarily. Yeah, I guess. Um, well, thank you for all that. That's that was really helpful. And I mean, just from a more kind of philosophical level on the chemistry, like is the the human condition trying to balance chemistry um, in some way in order to get to a set point that like when you're describing like some people who have been raised a certain way and, you know, it's it's their their set point is kind of in this place where they didn't get enough and like is it is it that like the the human behavior is trying to achieve some kind of balance point in the chemistry that's driving it, but it's not actually going to do it? Well, I do I absolutely do think that everybody has their own set point, just like everybody has their own proprietary blend of what makes their chemistry good or bad. And I and you know, I remind my husband quite a bit, actually, like you and I have different tolerances for intimacy. You know, everybody, uh, has a, you know, what, three feet or six feet or whatever, you know, something they're comfortable with, something they're not, you know, somebody starts getting too close, too personal, asking too many questions, maybe too clingy or too needy, you know, whatever these issues are for you. And you feel like you need to pull away. And a lot of times we know in couples, right? One person, you know, there's like a, a pursuer as <laughs> like a clinger and somebody who's moving away and getting pursued. And that can shift, you know, the polarity can shift Because the bottom line is that this person needs this much space and this person wants this much space. And so there's a lot of back and forth. And, you know, um, I I could and I very well may. I mean, my husband and I are really talking about uh, writing a book together, you know, about all of this and, you know, trying to to maintain equilibrium. Right. I mean, you know, as an individual, you have to maintain your own resilience and equilibrium you know you get stressed and then you calm down you get cortisol then you get the endocannabinoid system you know sympathetic comes and then parasympathetic says chill out and and you always you also get this between people right that there's there's a co-regulation that happens between two people where uh I can either put my partner in fight or flight or I can put my partner in in tend and befriend, right? I can rile them up or I can calm them down. And the longer you're together, the more (laughs) ammo you have for either way that you could do it. I mean, you know, I think a lot of couples, uh, they bicker, they fight, they toss barbs, they know how to rile each other up. And it keeps a certain frisson and, uh, um, you know, they fight, they make up and there's a lot of energy. And then there are other people um, my parents, I think, are a good example. Like they've really figured out how to keep each other in parasympathetic and how to to give to the other person and sort of give to the middle. And if you if you give to the relationship, there's enough for both people. And uh, you know, my mom talks about um, being sort of open hearted and giving, not giving up, not giving in, just giving to that person. You know what you feel like they need. 
But I also think that with couples, you sometimes give the person what you need because you're showing them by example, you know, this is how I want you to behave. So I'm going to give this thing to you. But they don't want that. It's like gift of the Magi, you know, and you're, you, you've done this great. I'm giving you this thing and I'm showing you how to be a giving person, but you're not giving them what they want. You're giving what you want to give. So um, that, again, all of this is sort of a long, a long <laughs> way um, to talk about uh, how difficult it is um, to be uh, to be in a dyad, but that the rules for connecting to self apply to connecting to others. And, you know, it's the stupid thing about putting your own oxygen mask on before you help the other person that you've got to get yourself calm and in parasympathetic before you engage. Mm -hmm. Like if a baby's crying, the best thing you can do is take a minute to like, fully calm yourself and then pick the baby up because the baby feels that you're calm and they stay calm and everybody's happy, you mm. know, and it's the same thing really with a partner or with a client or a patient or anything. Like if you are calm, if you are confident and you know, you know what you're doing, then they will also be calm and they will be confident and it feeds off each other. You know, you get a patient who's very anxious. You start to get more anxious. It cycles. It's the same mm -hmm. thing with, with couples. And I would also say it's the same thing in, you know, in communities um, that you can sort of set the tone for tend and befriend um, and not, you know, attacking and running away. You know, one of the things that's coming up for me as I listen to you talking about um, attending to it, one another and, and staying connected to ourselves while we're attending to the other person. Um, when I was practicing MDMA assisted psychotherapy, and I think you were the medical monitor on at least one of the studies I worked on with MAPS. Oh, I sure was. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was kind of uncanny how sometimes a participant uh, with eye shades and music on would say something to me or my co-therapist that was a question like, um, you know, Will, are, are you feeling something right now? Or Will, are you okay right now? And it was like, whoa, what's going on here? Like, and I, I wondered, because usually there was something going on when they asked the question. And yeah. it just, it took me down this rabbit hole of, well, with that heightened oxytocin, and the MDMA on board and all of the things that go with that. Um, is there sort of like this hyper intuition that happens? I definitely think people? so. And that, I mean, the way I think about it is it's almost like a, it's a, a, an enhanced yin state, you know, most of us, I mean, I, I imagine the three of us at least, and probably the people that are listening, uh, we have a lot of yang energy, you know, we've got to-do lists and things we have to get done and we've got meetings and, uh, you know, I mean, you know, maybe we're not we're not going nuts with all of it, but, you know, there's a lot of yang energy. It takes up a lot of our time. It seems important. We don't spend a lot of time taking in, you know, being a, a receiver and a receptacle, but we do have that capacity. And I think with MDMA and the enhanced oxytocin and then the quieted amygdala, you are in this ultra receptive, open hearted, uh, ultra yin state and i do believe strongly that we have the capacity to intuit other people's emotions i mean certainly the more oxytocin on board the more you're going to intuit emotions like we sort of know this from you know those stupid studies where you read the emotions through the eyes and things like that but i i do think that one thing that we haven't done yet because we're so busy i say we but you know the psychedelic community at large one of the things we haven't sort of focused on now they did a little bit in the past, we'll get to it in the future, is looking at things like extrasensory perception. And and I'm gonna sound so stupid here, but I really think there's something between interspecies communication that um, with uh, DMT or 5-MeO-DMT or ayahuasca or MDMA, uh, I've just, I've had enough people say to me that they really feel like they are having uh, communication, nonverbal, but significant communication with uh, other people who aren't people, other other things and animals that are not the human animal. So I think this kind of stuff, you know, looking looking at the impact of, of psychedelics on um, precognition, on, on, on ESP, um, I don't know about telekinesis, that I, I have a little trouble accepting that. 
But um, I do, well, I just, this idea of like enhanced intuition, of course. Speaking of other psychedelics, um, I'm wondering if we could just for a moment um, set aside the things that, the practicalities, let's say, of psychedelics, the, the context, the accessibility, the set and setting, the, all of the things, the, the ways of holding it responsibly and so forth. Um, if we could imagine a future, maybe not that far out, maybe five years, 10 years out where we have access inside of, at least inside of a medical set and setting for psilocybin, MDMA, maybe even LSD, cannabis. Um, how far do you think psychedelics can actually take us as a culture and the, the things that we need to, to face and, and heal and address together? Well, there's a lot there, right? I mean, um, you know, I talk about childhood trauma a little bit and good chemistry. And I also talk about the, the child, the, our nation's childhood trauma, basically like the early phase of the founding of the United States of America is, is built on genocide and slavery. And those are like tremendous childhood wounds from our national psyche. And, you know, a lot of these things are sort of coming home to roost now, and it's becoming very clear that all this repressed trauma that wasn't really dealt with is coming up. And, you know, the sort of the way that the pus finally comes to the top of an abscess. And, you know, the only way to really treat an abscess is you got to slice that thing open and get all the pus out. And it's, it's, it's work, <laughs> you know, and you got to, um, you have to heal it from the inside out or the abscess doesn't heal. And it really is this sort of, uh, you know, the last the last few years, I felt like we were kind of soaking in pus. It was just like so obvious that that these early childhood wounds in our country had completely festered. But one of the things that honestly gives me hope is um, is the perspective that you can get from a psychedelic experience. You know, we know from looking at research that people who have uh, psilocybin experiences are more likely to be environmentally conscious and environmentally active um, than people who haven't had psilocybin experiences. And we know that people who have had psilocybin experiences are more likely, <clears throat> sorry, less likely to be committing uh, domestic partner violence, uh, less likely to be recidivists if they happen to have a, a prison history. So, you know, there are pretty clear examples that uh, there can be societal good from exposure to psychedelics. And, um, you know, just am fascinated by Harriet DeWitt's recent uh, work with MDMA looking at, um, I don't want to say political affiliations because it's, it's not that, it's deeper than that, but it's sort of, it really is this issue of, <clears throat> uh, are you going to be somebody who just gets their own needs met and doesn't really care what, what anybody else is going through or what their needs are, or are you the kind of person who's going to sort of make sure that everybody is, is getting some of their needs met, you know, because that's what's more fair or what seems fair. And I think that experiences with MDMA and ayahuasca and uh, psilocybin, LSD, ibogaine, cannabis, you know, I, uh, ketamine, <laughs> and these things that allow a shift in perspective, uh, a little crack, you know, in the armor, uh, an open hearted feeling and you start to sort of care what other people are going through and you and you come to the uh, correct, I would say, conclusion that, you know, separation is really an illusion and we are all connected, whether we like it or not. And, you know, we're all sharing the planet Earth and uh, you're going to sing some sort of Kumbaya song. I'm, you know, it sounded like at least one uh, research subject in the Harriet DeWitt MDMA study was really questioning their own um, convictions about white supremacy. And so then what's really crucial is the integration, right? Let's say you come to these huge realizations like, oh my God, I was wrong. I'm doing it wrong. But then you get put back into your life. I've definitely been thinking uh, a lot more about how, how psychedelics can potentially not just heal us as individuals. Um, you know, we've seen, uh, at least with MDMA, that it can really help to heal scars that build up within a relationship. Um, and I really do think there's a place, especially for things like psilocybin and ayahuasca, um, for helping us sort of heal our relationship with, with our communities, with the planet. Uh, you know, we have a lot of trauma 
uh, it here in the United States of America, I think that, I don't know if I got into this already, but this, this idea that like our nation has childhood wounding, right? Our nation right. has like deep, uh, horrible, <laughs> odious, uh, you know, the genocide of the native populations and then the slavery and uh, the abuse that we heaped on many immigrants. So we have our own history of trauma as a nation that we really need to process. And I, like, how are we going to process this? But I think it's one of the great things about MDMA and, and other psychedelics is that they they allow you to process really big, horrible traumas that have happened. So I do sort of see a place somehow for psychedelics in and helping to heal the sort of national rift that is developing. The other thing that I'm just learning about, which I love, is is this concept of languishing. Um, you know that uh, if if you look at depression on one end of the spectrum and then really thriving on the other end, what's in the middle, right? You know, some of us aren't clinically depressed, but we're sure as hell not thriving. And there's this sort of middle ground of languishing where there's not a lot of meaning. There's not a lot of joy. There's a lot of drudgery. Um, I think a lot of us are sort of in that spot. And, you know, one of the the antidotes for languishing is is flow, being in flow, uh, you know, being sort of uh, sucked into a moment and losing yourself. And, you know, what facilitates flow? Lots of things, including microdosing and macrodosing. And so, again, I think there's a there's a potential other indication for yeah. psychedelics, which isn't in processing trauma, but what is just in getting us back on the right course in our lives where we, uh, where it's the, what we're doing is sort of feeding our soul. You know, I work with so many patients who their jobs are sort of sucking their soul out yeah. of them, you know, either because of what they're doing or who they're working with. It's taking away the joy and the meaning that, that could be inherent. And in, in if you're really doing work that sings to you or speaks to you, mine sings to me, but some people, their work just speaks to them. Um, but if, you know, if you're really engaged and you love what you're doing and you think what you're doing is important, it changes the whole quality of your life. And so I do think here, again, there's a place for cannabis, MDMA, psychedelics, and helping us to figure out what gives us joy? What does make your soul sing? You know, where should you really be putting your time and energy instead of, you know, your dead end job or, or, right. you know, this dog eat dog career that's, that, that has no meaning for you. It reminds me of, um, Bob Jesse's comment about the betterment of well people that Michael right. Pollan kind of brought forward and, and this concept of, you know, psychedelic wildness clubs where, you know, on your birthday or something, you could go and, you know, have an experience that kind of renews that spark that I think yeah. you're talking about. It is yeah. really somebody, somebody described it as like resetting their clocks or something, but it is sort of like, you know, giving it, you know, or like even cleaning your, your glasses, you know, when they start to get smudgy, um, mm. anything that sort of refreshes your perspective or just turns you around a little bit and says, which, okay, now that you're all turned around, which way do you really want to go? You know, yeah. right. um, you know, a lot, a lot of us are sort of lost uh, and, and we really have, I mean, I was just reading uh, Jamie Wheel's new book, which is all about the, the crisis of meaning basically. And where do we find meaning? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll tell you one place that I have absolutely found meaning over and over again, when I've gone to that well is psychedelics, you know, they yeah. help infuse things with meaning and they help you feel, I, I just, <clears throat> I, always, I always sort of have this idea of like, uh, this is a metaphor I use a lot, but it's because I like it. Um, when you're playing a video game, which I don't play, but sometimes if you just had a macro of the whole playing field, you would realize that you're spending all this time going around in a circle of one part of the field. And if you just turn your guy around and head out, there's a whole wide world to explore in the game, you know? And I think like, I think that psychedelics can give people a macro and be like, you could be over here or here, but see how you're just spinning your wheels and you're stuck in here, you know? There's right. a whole um, there's a whole other map out here that you can see. Yeah, so sometimes older. it's nice to have that per perspective of like the bigger picture. Yeah. Well, if we just hang, I want to want to go back to something that you mentioned that's really important to me. Just this idea of intergenerational trauma, idea of you know the trauma from history that we haven't worked through as a community, nationally, globally. Um, so historical trauma that's getting you know, passed down and passed down from generation to generation. And can you say a little more about how, if we were to start to try and address 
sort of this human condition where we're passing down trauma, not dealing with old wounds. Like, how would we use psychedelics to deal with that in, in, in communities? What would we do? Would we actually like use psychedelics in a way where we would be addressing that issue just like in in the intent of the actual psychedelic journey? Or are you just thinking more that just the psychedelic assisted therapies will naturally start to address those things? Well, I do think that the more any of us can uh, look inward and, and really do some deep work, I mean, that helps everybody, you know, anybody who's doing work on themselves, there's a little bit of a ripple outward. But I think it's possible to me that you can really do group work around intergenerational trauma, that you could do family work around intergenerational trauma. Um, you know, we're having like a uh, a webcast <laughs> about uh, psychedelics and Judaism and sort of Jewish intergenerational trauma. And um, I am a Jewess, so I understand why they put me on the on the speakers panel, but I am no expert in intergenerational trauma. And I, you know, I'm not too sure what I'm going to say about it, but I just, I know intuitively that tools like MDMA and ayahuasca and psilocybin can help sort of open our hearts and minds to this, to the reality of intergenerational trauma and to be able to hold space for it and talk about it and process it. I really think there's tremendous promise in group work. You know, we haven't, we haven't seen the tip of the iceberg in group work, but a lot of the early work with MDMA was really done in groups, couples, individuals, right. and groups, and, you know, yeah. tremendous things happen in groups. So, yeah. I mean, my, you know, I've experienced in group work only as far as I attended raves in, you know, Philadelphia, New York City in the 90s. Uh, that was my group work, but I was pretty impressed then by what it could do. So, right. uh, you know, I'm an eternal optimist, and I think that you have to name it to tame it, right? The first thing is just for everybody to start talking about things like intergenerational trauma, historical trauma. Now this issue that's that's coming out with Rachel Yehuda and um, her colleague whose name I can't remember, but it's another woman. I like to try to remember the women's names. They're working on a uh, moral injury, right? This idea that maybe you don't have PTSD from being in the war, but you have a certain sort of soul sickness because you did things that you didn't ever think you would do, or you saw other people do things that you thought were horrendous and you're, your, your ethics have been injured. You know, you have a moral injury, you don't have a physical injury. I think that we could make the case, you know, anybody who who watched the, you know, nine minute videotape of, of George Floyd being murdered, uh, experience, you know, not anybody, but I would hope most people experienced a moral injury that, you know, they're outraged that this kind of thing could happen. It, you know, makes you sick. It makes you upset. You, you didn't think that you were going to die, but you still got traumatized um, by seeing it happen, you know? So I think that uh, if you're a little fuzzy on the criteria of PTSD, I feel like everybody in the United States of America and probably around the world, you know, between COVID and climate catastrophe <laughs> uh, and all the terrible things that are happening, you know, we're all getting sort of injured psychically, whether we have a moral injury or whether we're really, in, you know, in fear for our lives because of COVID. But it's it's been a very traumatizing period of time. I think any anybody would agree that, you know, that's where we're at. And we've got this sort of extra scrim of racial trauma here in the United States. But I imagine that they have racial trauma in lots of places. Yeah. yeah. Well, Julie, how, what would you, is there anything you want people to know about you, um, your book or anything you want to mention here? Um, gosh, I don't know. Uh, what can I say? Um, uh, my most recent book uh, came out in June. It's called Good Chemistry. Uh, the one before that is a book about women and how they're sort of over-medicated, over-pathologized, over-diagnosed. That's called Moody Bitches. Um, I have two nonprofit books, one about MDMA called Ecstasy, The Complete Guide, and one about cannab cannabis called The Pot Book. And then um, maybe my favorite <laughs> is uh, my memoir about my time when I was uh, running the psychiatric emergency room at Bellevue, and that's called Weekends at Bellevue. So if you want to learn more about things... Oh, yeah. um, and, you know, stay tuned. It's a really, it's a great, exciting time to be a psychiatrist. It's obviously things are really booming in, in the cannabis space and the psychedelic space uh, with MDMA. It's a really uh, interesting time. You know, not only are, 
are we in tremendous need, I think, in psychiatry, in the field of psychiatry, um, we need better tools and those better tools are coming. And I would say it's just in time. You know, we've got more need than ever um, and we've got better tools than ever. But there is this sort of period right now where it's not fully on board. It's not legal. I guess I would like to maybe give a shout out to the people who are doing underground work because uh, I see you and I appreciate that you're in this crazy limbo position right now. And, you know, to some degree, you are really doing the Lord's work. I think a lot of us are really concerned about the interaction of prescription antidepressants or worse prescription, you know, mood stabilizers or antipsychotics uh, and and what those sort of medicines, you know, there's a I think this is the next sort of hurdle we have to get over is the drug interactions, right? The interactions between the prescription medicine and things like MDMA, psilocybin, ayahuasca, because there are clearly medicines you cannot be on. There are situations where the meds are incompatible. Um, that's one of the reasons why people are using ketamine right now, you know, fairly easily is that it does mix well with other meds. But I think this is going to be a big issue moving forward. Uh, yeah, for those, I agree. If anybody can be an expert on that, it would be helpful <laughs> to the rest of us. Great. Well, we end the uh, podcast with the same question to every guest, which is, if there was a billboard with a paragraph on it and every human would see it once in their lifetime, what would you tell them in like five to seven sentences? Well, I, you know, I actually had this great poem pulled up for last time we were talking that I wanted to read. And if you give me a second, I will try to find it. It's just, I don't even know where to look right now because it's so weird. Just hold that thought for a second sure. because I didn't, I didn't have time uh, ahead of time, but I really, I saw the questions before and I found this, this is a poem that I know pretty well, but I want to read it. But now, because I'm having trouble forgetting, it's not here on my list. Yes. All right. Um, I'm not going to be able to find it in time. <laughs> anyway, the, the gist of the poem is um, don't, you know, stop going to church to be holy. What you really need to be holy is to go out into the community and help people who are in need. And that's the biggest priority. And that, you know, when you give of yourself and when you help other people, you get fed, you get nourished. Um, and that's really where where people need to focus. So I'm sorry that's not a sound bite. <laughs> that's a sound bite. But, but it's sound still bite. it's still my message is, you know, and it, it is kind of like a 12-step a, a thing too. When people say, like, I don't know what to do, what should I do? And the stock answer is be of service. Yeah. Um, yeah. I still think that you can get a lot from giving. You know, we're in sort of a, a takey mode and um, it's, you know, all the conspicuous consumption isn't getting us where we want to be. And you really need to reverse and stop taking in and start giving to really feed yourself. Mm, great. Beautiful. Well, thanks for being on the show. Yeah. Absolutely. Wonderful to have you. Thank you for having me anytime.